Good morning. Thanks for having me, Sally, and the whole GSIP team. Uh, personally delighted to be here. And um, Bank of America Merrill Lynch has been pleased to be a partner, uh, certainly for the last two or three years, and continue working together. It's very important from our perspective. Um, we really represent um, getting capital to this very important capital-intensive sector. Um, and we need to get that capital efficiently. Everything you've heard this morning, and in fact, what you've heard before coming here today, is how difficult it is to replace fossil fuels with something this capital intensive. And how do you provide the stability to attract the capital? And how do you get the regulators comfortable that these disruptive technologies um, can be integrated into a very large grid? So that, that demand for our time is endless. And it's uh, all of the constituents that Sally mentioned as she was so kind to introduce me. These all have, we all have a stake in how this is done, and not everyone agrees with what the solution should be. Um, simply speaking, I think there are two themes here that fortunately, by virtue of the disruptive technologies that have been introduced over the last 20 years, and by the scale we're finally begrudgingly achieving to bring those costs down, there are two themes that are very clear. One is that we love our electricity. Um, we rely on our electricity. It's almost a God-given right, like water. Um, but a, a big segment of the world does not have access to electricity, be it clean or otherwise. And as we work on these disruptive technologies and we transform our grid into, a fact, a much cleaner, less disruptive environmentally uh, and efficient grid, that these changes will come at a, uh, bring the cost down for these cleaner technologies, and they could be applied um, not only in the OECD or the newly industrialized countries, but also in areas that have not had consistent access to electricity. This, along with access to clean water and food and education, will help reduce poverty, which I think should be a very important goal for all of us. So we think both of these themes will benefit from the same trends that I'm going to speak of today and that I think will be reaffirming what you've heard earlier today from your prior speakers. Um, the message is largely upbeat. I mean, the last three months have been pretty challenging if you look at your equity portfolio. And um, as oil prices have come down, there's been a shock to the system. And a lot of the players we'll speak of today in terms of at the frontier of innovations to finance have had their stock prices drop by almost 50%, if not more. And there's a new question about how reliable is this. It's nothing like what we faced in 2008 through th through 2010, but clearly a disruption brought by um, the rapid reduction of commodity prices globally. So notwithstanding that, the message is still relatively upbeat in that we are finally to a point where we are deploying, um, deploying new technologies that are grid parity worthy, particularly with the current subsidy regime in many jurisdictions and we're embracing more disruptive technologies like batteries and what we've heard for the last 45 minutes on smart grid to further bring the cost down. But that's a very upbeat message. There's nothing you're gonna hear from me that counter that is negative to that. It's really a question of what is the pace of change? How quickly can we transform? And wh who are the actors who are going to win and lose the process of this? And th the overall themes are pretty obvious. We want security of supply. I think uh, in the presidential election that will be clear given the uh, tumult in the Middle East. Environmental stewardship, um, I think if you look at uh, opinion polls, it goes up and down based on how people are doing economically. And there's a perception of can we afford to do this? But I think with what you're seeing today, what you're hearing today is we can absolutely, we cannot afford not to, and that the cost of not doing this exceeds um, the small cost, uh, the, this massive capital infusion but th that um, there's growing consensus environmentally, this is critical. Um, there's a preference by individuals to control their own power, just as they've controlled their transportation and controlled other factors of their home. And the future utility, not only with the grid discussion we've just had, but also with respect to technology, you're going to see more distributed power, more control for how you consume, when you consume, and what form of power you consume in the home, and less reliance on a centralized grid. Now, um, obviously there are challenges. Um, demand for electricity has been relatively low, and part of that are the new technologies and energy efficiency that's been cost effective. Part of that is the reason why we have almost zero interest rates, that our economy is not growing that fast, and certainly has not been that capital intensive. So capital formation 
and GDP growth has not been there um, in the United States. Obviously, globally, um, you've got enormous demand for power that's unmet. China, India, parts of Africa, certainly in Latin America, you see rapid growth. So you really have a tale of two, two cities. You've got the OECD, which is anemic growth, but where a lot of the technology is being deployed, and you've got the emerging growth countries who have less efficient markets, uh, need the capacity, and have to um, really work to make it an attractive investment environment for money to come in. At the same time, we're here in the middle of Silicon Valley, the technological disruptions have never been more prominent with respect to the electric grid. And um, whether it's batteries or fuel cells or bits and bits and watts, um, it's all good. And it's uh, billions of capital will be needed, if not trillions. But as we bring down that cost, that will be very cost effective versus the status quo. There is enormous amount of untapped capital out there. I think we'll, we'll talk today about how volatile the public markets are, and that's, that's kind of noise around the edges because most of this capital is not coming from the public equity markets. Most of this capital is coming from pensions funds, sovereign wealth funds, large banks, insurance companies, and other forms of capital. Um, but it all relies on government policy. And that's not just to say, this is high cost, so let's set up a subsidy. This is because it's a 20 to 30 year payback period that you need to be in an environment that has a stable regulatory regime so that the providers of capital feel they're getting a fair return. If they are not getting a fair return, what they charge for that capital, if they provide it at all, is very high. And that works against bringing down the levelized cost of energy. It may be obvious, so I'm sorry to point it out, but I, it's in my preamble. So the good news is investment, this shows you investment has accelerated. And there'll be a series of bar charts here that by the end of the speech will be indistinguishable from each other. But hopefully the data will kind of match and so that you won't catch me uh, saying one thing and telling you another later. But the, um, the aggregate amount of capital as measured by Bloomberg in this case has grown pretty dramatically since the financial crisis. And you'll notice that the amount going into Europe has receded, which is not a big surprise given the problems in Southern European and the sovereign debt crisis. The amount in the United States has practically doubled. If you look at the bar charts, I don't know if it's actually doubled. And the amount in Asia has gone up dramatically. And what we'll talk about throughout today is that the form of that capital, the form has changed, and where the capital is going has changed. Early in the century, a lot of the capital was going upstream to build solar manufacturing, to build wind manufacturing. Now, as we've gotten those cost efficiencies and that manufacturing has moved to low cost markets and been more commoditized, um, you're seeing more of the capital going toward deployment. That is people around the room putting rooftop solar panels on their home or uh, United States utilities or Canadian utilities or Brazilian utilities uh, or Indian and Chinese utilities exploiting that much lower cost and deploying it in their own system. So what we'll consider deployment capex has gone up dramatically. Um, manufacturing capacity is pretty much in balance and there will be manufacturing expenditures going forward, particularly as we innovate and find ways to bring the cost down. But most of that has been on deployment, which shows you we really are at utility scale, which, which is to say we are now at a, at a big enough size that solar and wind, for example, in the United States, have been the largest single additions to the grid over the last several years. And that was never the case, right? This was something you celebrated uh, with a Grateful Dead sticker on the back of your VW bus at, a, at some sort of conference 15 years ago, right? This was not economic. Now it's economic. It is what's being deployed. If you go to Texas, West Texas, it is being deployed. If you go to rooftop solar in Hawaii and California, it's being deployed and it's being deployed in the Northeast. So really wind in the central regions and solar on both coasts. And um, in Germany, rooftop solar has decimated uh, the two, the, the, the local utilities there. And, um, and then you see the amount of grid investment here. And we've already, I don't wanna belabor it because you've spent the last 45 minutes talking about how important it is, but there's an equal amount of capital required for that as well. Costs have come down, and I think the estimates may be a little bit different around depending on who you talk to. Um, this again, I think, was, was coming from um, uh, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. But you see wind, uh, the cost curve has come down. Really, the cost of buying the equipment on a megawatt basis has stayed pretty constant, $2,000 a kW. Um, 
but the or two dollars a kW, two thousand uh, dollars, basically uh, a mil two million a watt, the um, a megawatt. The um, but the caught, but what you've seen is innovation as the blades have gotten longer and the and the components have gotten lighter and the controller software has gotten better, you've seen capacity factors. That is the percentage of time the wind farm actually turns and, and produces electricity has gone up from the high 20s to the high 30s, even in the 40s. And we've, we've financed, with tax equity, we've financed wind farms that have over 50% capacity factors in the continental United States. So that is a dramatic increase. So even though the cost per watt has stayed constant, the cost per kilowatt hour has declined pretty dramatically and should continue to do so. Uh, both thin film and traditional PV costs have come way down. Part of that was post the crisis, there was just excess capacity and there was no money to be made upstream, so they were giving it away at, at marginal cost. But the supply and demand are pretty much in balance. You've seen a recent uptick. We call that tariffs. <laughs> so that was politically driven. And you see um, there's a downturn again. And so we've got some slides later on that'll show you at least we at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch and others believe the cost of solar will continue to decline. Not only the cost of the panel and the cost of the inverters, but you'll see all of the balance of systems costs. So as we go to deploy more, it'll be much cheaper. Now, even, so this is just to illustrate just how enormous the grid is not only in the United States, but globally, the global grids, if you will. And that despite all of this investment, we've moved from roughly 20% renewables as defined, I think here by the UN, or in this case, the National Renewable Energy Lab, to 23%. So a lot of that is hydro or biofuels or biomass that really hasn't grown that much. What's really grown that base is predominantly wind and solar. And you'll see in the US, it's gone from just under 10% to over 13%. So that's a pretty significant move for a grid that's about um, you know, 1,000 gigawatts in the United States. So it's a, when, you, when you talk about the low capacity factors for wind and solar, just the massive inflow, it also is a function of low gas prices, which is an elephant in the room. And on the one hand, low gas prices make it very hard for renewables to be competitive because it's all capital and you're displacing something that's declining in cost. But on the other hand, low gas prices have decimated coal uh, generation. And so we've really seen a shutdown, economic shutdown of massive quantities of coal generation in this country. Coal was roughly 50%, I think, of generation. I think it's down to the mid 40s, maybe even lower now. You may have the latest data. So even lower than that. So that trend should continue and the EPA and their rules combined with the economic realities. Have, have, there have been no new coal plants built in years, at least in this country. Globally, it's another story. And so here, I told you about the future. I mean, I think on Resi, for example, if you look at what Solar City or Sunrun or Vivint, uh, three public companies have told the financial community and what the, the institutional investors are very focused on is what is your cost to deploy? And a lot of these costs are certainly at the bottom. The blue bars are the hard costs for the equipment. But a lot of these are soft costs, um, sales. Um, Resi Solar is still effectively sold door to door. It's sold when you get home and your phone rings and it's inconvenient, right? That's somebody or you get it by email. So it is still um, an expensive way to originate um, new generation. Um, and there are uh, permitting issues. Every town in this country has their own permitting rules, whereas Germany, there's one set of permits. So we have a cost per watt that's projected to be well under $2 a watt by 2017. And right now it's closer to $3 a watt for the best players. We talked about onshore wind and the cost coming down there with components, so it's a more gradual decline. But um, going from $3 to $1.75 is extremely important in terms of those scale economics and making, um, making resi solar and distributed solar more affordable, not only for homeowners, but for small commercial and industrial players as well. And so as a consequence of all this, it wouldn't surprise you that the amount of renewables, the percentage of all the generation being added is growing. And um, again, relying on Bloomberg, it shows you it's roughly in balance today, more renewables than anything else um, globally, but that will be disproportionately so in the future by 2030. And um, so that's really remarkable. We are literally turning over the grid to rely on this as it's more cost competitive. And, and, and this data could be understated because it's very hard to project future technological disruptions that should drive this down even further. So, um, 
I don't need to spend a lot of time on smart grid. I mean, we've spent a good chunk of the morning talking about it, but it's something probably not particularly well understood by the financial community, but it really will be required not only to integrate this variety, these variety of new sources of generation, but to also keep the cost down. It is prohibitively expensive, time consuming, if, if at all practical, to build long haul transmission around the United States. People really don't like it in their backyard. I don't know if you'd want to see one either. So it's very hard to get permitting to expand our grid. So a lot of the resources we're talking about for wind or even utility scale solar are not where people are. They tend to be where people are not. Um, it's still hard to permit um, because there's other environmental disruptions. So smart grid is enabling us to integrate with the grid we have, be more cost effective and conscious of where we can make investments with our existing grid to improve the efficiency rather than adding a new line. And the amount of capital going to that is incredible. Um, it, there was a bit of a lull after the financial crisis because this is upfront capital that needs to get passed through to consumers. So it would really in the short term raise rates where in the long term it would, it would defer or postpone permanently the need for new generation. And so there was a cost benefit analysis early that I think slowed the adoption of smart grid, but it's accelerating now. Now, we, we should spend a little bit of time on batteries, and I, I think we probably have with the prior two presentations, but this is a recent study that just came out. There are a couple studies, and it's been quite topical with Tesla's um, announcement earlier on not only their new car, but where they are with a gigafactory in terms of, and I know we had some questions earlier about what is the right metric for batteries and how will the market kind of embrace it from a value perspective. But clearly the cost per watt is coming down pretty dramatically, steeper than what I showed you for wind or for solar, which doesn't surprise you. Those are more mature disruptive technologies. And, and there's um, whether or not this line at $375 or $350 a kilowatt, a dollar per kilowatt of capacity, whether that is the magic line to drive demand off the grid, clearly we're, we're getting, we're within two years of hitting that. And so we're seeing much more activity anecdotally on battery deployment here in California and elsewhere in the country. And we're seeing global interest from major strategics to buy into that story. Not everyone wants to buy a gigafactory. Not everyone wants to own the manufacturing, but there's clearly incredible value, whether it be peak load shaving or whether it would be for ancillary services. And many of the, um, not necessarily the federal government, but many of the states and the power regions, like PJM has a frequency response ancillary services market that's developed where batteries have been deployed pretty significantly at quite attractive returns for investors. So right now we're in the very early innings of seeing this battery deployment on a stationary basis, but it's going to grow exponentially. And that will be an incredible game changer for the utilities. And to give you some sense of visibility of that cost curve, this is just a way to try to break down some of the costs coming down are simply scale, uh, more efficiency with the cell and the pack costs. Um, fixed expenses have been a misnomer. That's just as you build more of these factories, you have more, more capital to depreciate. That's a non-cash charge, certainly has an upfront expense. And then um, obviously as the business matures, some of the, um, some of the unusually high uh, returns will decline as the market becomes more efficient and winners are declared such that uh, it may be a big swag here, but to think there's almost a 50% ongoing decline from where we are today to where we can be um, certainly in five years, this, this is dramatic. Probably the most dramatic slide, the most dramatic fact impacting the grid over the next five years that I know of. But we've talked about this utility model. It's much more complicated when you're producing the electricity, you're storing it. Um, it's resilient, but it takes new systems, and all of that requires a fair amount of uh, not only hard dollars for the grid, but also dollars on software and on systems management and network management. So um, timing-wise here, um, obviously the infrastructure requires some stability, and that's been the problem in places like India and parts of Africa where you haven't had the stability to attract the capital at a cost-effective level. Um, but is that as the technology costs come down and the period of time you need to generate those returns declines, it should be more attractive. Um, we can go through some of this. This is just to show you in terms of the public markets to give you a snapshot of how little public markets matter for renewables right now. If you take the collective market cap, 
of anything we could find that we could call clean energy or renewables, it was just over 400 million. Now, granted, it was a little higher a few months ago. Um, so, but ExxonMobil was a little higher a few months ago as well. Um, but if you look at the entire global oil and glass complex, this is a fraction. So this is not a question of access to capital. It's a question of transparency of the growth wedge and the returns and the regulatory regimes and the economics. This is kind of a scary chart in that this is how the public perceives it when they look at their 401k, right? Um, it, the um, renewables, solar stocks are just wild speculation, right? You buy them and you hope uh, oil doesn't go down. So solar has been correlated with oil. A lot of the investors in renewables have been savvy energy investors. And so when energy stocks decline, these mutual funds get cash calls and they have to reallocate their capital to other sectors and they sell what's worked for them and they sell what they can. So we've had collateral damage, if you will, on the renewable side. I know that doesn't sound like a very efficient market thesis, um, but trust me, in the near term, when there are disruptions, um, there are more sellers than buyers, which makes sense when the stocks go down. Um, solar, uh, the solar companies in this index have changed from the big manufacturers to those deploying it downstream. And this was both a fear that growth wasn't sustainable, that returns were too low, and that the, the fast money was gone. So we've had a correction, um, but this is a base upon which um, there are still several public companies that can grow. Um, the regulatory regimes we can talk about, but suffice it to say, every country has a different way. We, we have the benefit of having a federal government, state governments, local governments, and all kinds of other interest groups. So we have, we have a myriad of ways to promote renewables, some of which conflict with each other. Um, some of the countries have more centralized approaches. Um, the trick is to have continuity in that so that capital can be mobile. Europe is a pretty telling example of what happens when regulatory regimes change. So um, after the financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, many of the southern European sovereigns who had supported renewables more aggressively than elsewhere were unable to continue that. And so in Spain, for example, you had an event called the Royal Decree. So there was a, a term in the uh, power purchase agreements that people didn't focus on, lenders didn't focus on, that meant if the king decided the price should be lower, the price would be lower. So that was not good uh, for people who own the asset because they had leveraged it about 80%, 75 or 80% against the 20 year annuity stream. And when the price declined, the creditors were even having to take a discount, which meant the equity was zero. So when that happens, investment, um, what's the term, dries up. Uh, people don't come back. Greece obviously was the problem. Um, Germany and France continue to have access to capital. Um, and that investment continued to take place, but there was a major drop off in, in Europe as a consequence has dropped about 50% in investment. There are, there are a lot of ways, I mean, this is a utility, um, utility scale sector, but it's, it's attractive because you've got venture capitalists um, supporting disruptive technologies. You've got private equity and other companies supporting things after the venture capitalist. You've got the IPO market, and then you have large strategics and utilities who want to invest. And then there's a whole myriad of ways on the liability side to bring that cost down between green bonds, between asset-backed securitizations. Um, there are a whole host of ways to use financial innovation to complement the innovation we've been talking about here on the asset side. Um, the IPO market um, was very strong in the early part of the, the century with manufacturers, and really now it's been more toward deployment, which is consistent with the themes we've been talking about. Yield co's, um, have been a very active issuer, and the, they're much like master limited partnerships. It's a way for institutions to invest, get a current yield and, and growth with pretty safe, um, and those have been very active issuers. Um, they've suffered some headwinds now because of the decline of MLPs. Green bonds is a way for large strategics to allocate capital to renewable ventures and get credit for it by issuing a certified green bond. So it's been a very attractive um, IR move for those companies with attractively priced capital, and increasingly the rating agencies are on board rating renewable projects as investment grade. So the amount of capital coming out of the debt markets continues to be uh, quite strong. And the banks, because of the myriad of incentives, the banks continue to play a disproportionate role than other sectors. Um, we talked about green bonds. Securitization, this is an asset class where if you have a 20-year consumer receivable, 
It's much like taking a package of mortgages or car loans, only better. These are very credit worthy. So there have been a handful of these done with a lot of fanfare. So the financial innovation continues to bring costs down, the technology's there, and so that's why I told you it's a relatively upbeat message, notwithstanding what's going on in the equity markets. Um, with that, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Sure. Oh, do we, do we not have time for questions? We, you, you're the boss, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, so real quick, these uh, new tools that the financial markets have for financing this, how uh, much are those reliant on the fact that right now there's very low interest rates across the world? Look, certainly low interest rates are a positive factor. Uh, people are searching for yield, and that's really what drove the yield co. Um, you could get a 5 or 6% yield, and the sponsors promised 10% growth. Who gets a 16% return clipping coupons with, on an asset class that's got a utility offtake that may be rated single A or at least triple B? Um, rising interest rates are clearly a threat um, to capital formation. I mean, as interest rates go up, the cost of carry for these investments will rise. Um, generally, though, when interest rates are going up, commodity prices are going up. I don't know of too many economic regimes uh, where you've had sustained rise in interest rates. We have a deflationary market where you had some other form of inflation with commodity prices dropping. But in the long term, we think um, at the interest rates we're talking about that we foresee, that's not really a major headwind um, for the major solar and wind players. I think a bigger headwind is what is the clearing price of electricity on grid and what is the, what is the scale and the scope and the persistence of cost reductions over time. Yeah, please. Uh, Mac Irvin, good to see you again. See Informative you, and entertaining as always. Um, I'd like to describe my view of a particular company, and if you'd be willing to comment on it. Uh, Probably in, not, but go ahead. Yeah. In this case, <laughs> it, it, I'll, I'll be gentle about it. Uh, NRG has been uh, one of the few companies that has um, mixed conventional and renewable activities. Yes. Um, a very vocal, high-profile CEO who, if you listen to the Chatterati, is in some sort of trouble, what are the implications of NRG's success or failure? You made a point that capital markets are such a small part of what's going on in this space. Thank you. Look, it's a great question, and um, it should shows you market psychology. NRG was the first to do a yield co uh, in 2013, where they have a big coal, they're a big traditional coal and gas generation fleet so a merchant generator, independent power producer, whatever you want to call it, all of the above. And they had built up a pretty substantial solar business and then acquired a wind business here in California in the Tehachapi region. And they took the, this uh, renewable business public because as a coal generator with the price of gas low and with environmental regulation, they were trading at a very low multiple, really off a of free cash flow. It was a declining business. I mean, that, um, and so the renewable business was a growing business but it should trade at a higher multiple. So as other companies, it sounds like mumbo jumbo, and I'm sorry if that's what you think, but there is a trend towards separating businesses that are very different and creating pure plays in the market so that investors can make an individual investment decision on one theme as opposed to looking at a company that has five or six themes and weighing the various merits. So they did that and they sold 20% of the yield co off and it's been largely quite successful. I think um, some of the other moves on residential solar and some of the other investments, disruptive investments in charging stations. I think um, in, a, in a period where commodity prices are in decline, some investors questioned whether that was the right place to incubate it and perhaps whether others should incubate it. And so I think that's what they're grappling with at the board level now. But we have a lot of respect for David and, and his team and have done a lot of work with them. Feed-in tariff versus the investment tax credit for, for uh, right. making renewables um, work. Right. Well, the, um, I think from a political perspective, um, the investment tax credit is how we've motivated renewable deployment in this country along with the production tax credit. And it has the benefit of being below the line so that when consumers get their electricity bill, they don't see they're paying 30 cents a kilowatt hour for, for something. And so you get the deployment. It has the disadvantage of requiring whoever is the beneficiary of that credit to be able to use it or to monetize it. 
And so there are some inefficiencies in the market requiring to use tax equity. So it brings up the cost of capital. We at Bank of America Merrill Lynch are one of the largest players in that market. And I think that also shows you that we think it's somewhat inefficient and we like deploying capital there. So it uh, proves the point. So um, look, I think the, um, we're going to be better off bringing costs down. The, the way the incentives have worked in the country may not be perfect, but they've been very powerful. Where you see where costs have gone from solar 15 years ago to where they are now, I can't think of another technological change in cost on a grid scale that compelling. So it's worked. There probably were maybe more efficient ways of doing it, but this was what Congress liked and Congress kept extending, and so the industry's adapted to it. Feed-in tariffs were not sustainable in Ontario. Uh, new, you know, when a new team administration is elected and they see what the costs were to put it in, it's one of the first things that goes. So even though it's efficient, people doubt its sustainability. Any subsidized industry tends to trade at a lower multiple in the market because, I don't know about you, you guys, I mean, we all partner with the government, it's, it's important, and we value that partnership as a bank, as a large money center bank, uh, we have to. Uh, but, but clearly the, the equity markets view with suspicion subsidies and their duration. So you tend to trade at a lower multiple if you are subsidy reliant. Uh, actually, on that same note, um, with the ITC scheduled to drop to 10% um, at the end of 2016, how do you see that impacting the sort of large-scale solar development? That's a great question. It, it's perceived to impact resi solar because the 30% has been pretty powerful. Um, we think with where the costs are coming down, in a way, it's mitigated because that means there'll be more debt in the capital structure than tax equity. Debt is cheaper than tax equity. So while, yes, having less money at time of close is not good for levelized costs, um, the change is, is largely mitigated by the ability to raise efficient debt and by the reduction of the cost of panels. I think one of the reasons you've seen companies spending so much to get scale while the, while the ITC is at 30% was to prepare for that day. Those companies who haven't gotten scale yet that are going to try to do it after that step down are gonna have a much bigger problem. So that's why there's a perception of winners and losers in the space, those who've succeeded to date and those who are still struggling to get that scale. Anyway, thank you all for your time and your questions. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks.